Nai mai, haere mai, kia ora tato, and welcome to episode 12 in the Auckland Writers' Festival Winter Series. Ko Paula Morris, toko ingoa, my name is Paula Morris. I'm speaking to you as usual from Grays Avenue in central Auckland, and for those of you who are observant, yes, we have moved around the furniture. In this hour, we're exploring secret selves, occasions of disguise and discovery in fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. The format for this episode will be familiar to many of you. I'll talk with our three writers about their books. Each will give a short reading. And towards the end of the episode, our writers will return together for a final question or two. You are very welcome as ever to make comments or ask questions throughout the episode. Just use the chat functions on Facebook and YouTube. I will try to include your questions if I can. Thanks as ever to our generous technical partner, Auckland Live, and to Copyright Licensing New Zealand for their support in helping make this series possible. The series is free to view, so if anyone asks you for credit card information, please do not give them your money. Remember that the books we're discussing today are available for sale or order. Just click on the buy the book link in the episode description. However, don't click on any links in the comments unless those links are supplied by the Auckland Writers' Festival. Now, let's welcome our three writers and find out exactly where they are in the world. Uh, first, uh, Patrick Gale, here to discuss his novel, Take Nothing With You. Kia ora, Patrick. Good evening. Well, good morning. It's um, night has just fallen here. I'm at the very tip of Cornwall in my office in the garden, and there are wonderful bats flying past the window over the flowers. Now, by the tip of Cornwall, do you, you, you don't, you mean? Barry. Land's End, Land's Gosh. End. I'm the last, I'm the last writer in England. I, I beat John le Carre by five miles. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, Patrick. Uh, let's also welcome uh, Julia Ebner, the author of Going Dark, The Secret Social Lives of Extremists. Willkommen und schöne Grüße aus Neuseeland, Julia. Kia ora. Thank you, Shun. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, it's the same uh, here as for Paul. It's really late in the evening. It's 11 p.m. now, but I'm in Ibiza. Uh, to be honest, I'm just trying to escape the London. I was just trying to escape the London lockdown because I was in lockdown for three and a half months. And it's now really nice in Ibiza because it's very calm. The clubbing scene is, is not very active at the moment. So it's more of a relaxed um, holiday rather than the typical uh, Ibiza flair that we, <laughs> that some of you might have been to or heard of. Kia ora, Julia, and thank you very much for joining us. And our third guest today, closer to home, is Michelle Leggett, the author of Metzaluna Selected Poems. Kia ora, Michelle. Kia ora, Paula, and everybody. Um, I'm in Devonport, which is on the north shore of Auckland. I'm in my office. It's a pretty nice day outside, and... Uh, I have for company my retired guide dog, who should be slightly snoring in the background. <laughs> will not interrupt, promise. Thanks, Michelle. And of course, uh, you and I are experiencing the usual gruelling Auckland winter, which is extremely mild, of course. Extremely usual. mild, yeah. So uh, we're going to talk first today with Patrick. So see you in a moment, Julia and Michelle. Uh, Patrick Gale, many of you will know, he has been described as one of, as one of Britain's best-loved novelists and is the author of almost 20 works of fiction. He made his screenwriting debut in 2017 with Man in an Orange Shirt, an award-winning two-part drama which formed part of the BBC's Gay Britannia season. And if you haven't seen it already, you can watch uh, Patrick's series in New Zealand on Amazon Prime. Patrick is also the co-founder and artistic director of the North Cornwall Book Festival, which has just launched an at-home series online. In his latest novel, Take Nothing With You, a man named Eustace, living a well-appointed London life, remembers growing up in the 70s in an unglamorous town, Western Supermare, with its estuary mud and its old age population. Patrick has called it the perfect setting for a story of provincial gay boyhood in the 70s. His father is opposed to him learning ballet, so Eustace learns clarinet and then the cello after a transformative experience hearing his future teacher, Carla Gold, perform. Carla tells Eustace that music is a passion, not a hobby. And Eustace for a while feels admitted into the blessed circle of the musical. 
but passions can have unexpected and sometimes very unhappy consequences, as Eustace and his family discover. Tenakwe Patrick, thanks for joining us to talk about this wonderful book. Well, it's a delight to be here. And I don't want anyone listening who's from Western Supermare to feel as though I'm disrespecting it. So would you talk briefly about why you chose that as the setting for Eustace's childhood? Yes, um, because I grew up in the 1970s in Winchester, which is um, also provincial, but a lot smarter than Western. Western is one of those very British, rather faded seaside resorts. It's got lovely Regency houses. It should be utterly charming. But for some reason, it has been taken over by old people's homes and halfway homes for people recovering from drug addiction and places for people just released from um, mental hospitals. So it's it's got a dark underbelly to it. Um, and there's absolutely nothing to do once you've eaten your fish and chips. So it, it struck me as the perfect place for this poor only child, Eustace, to grow up and to learn dark truths about life. And we're going to be talking a lot about darkness and light in this episode. And you've mentioned two literary sources for your novel that suggest those two different pathways. Um, in my notes, by the way, which are handwritten, I scrawled something that could either be literary godmothers or literary god writers. And I think <laughs> we go with either. Uh, the first is L.P. Hartley's The Go-Between, which was published in 1953. And the other is the classic children's book, Ballet Shoes by Noel Stratfield, published in 1936. One is about a, ch a child sub uh, ensnared in adult subterfuge. The other perhaps about the escape art offers and the tension between art and money. And also one is much darker than the others. And I wondered, how do these two books help you form the story or your approach to it? Well, Ballet Shoes was a, a great influence on me. Um, I read it actually as, as quite a small boy. My big sister had a copy and I did have, just like Eustace, a brief ballet bug before music hooked me in. What I really wanted to write about here was resilience. I, I'm a great believer in the way both ballet and gymnastics and music are disciplines which if children learn them early enough and to be any good, they do have to start early they will acquire a, a real kind of strength of purpose and character, which will see them through in life, even if they let that particular pursuit go. Um, I was a very, very musical child. I had a, an obsessively musical education to the point where by the age of 15, I really assumed I would be a professional musician. Um, I didn't become one, I became a novelist, thank God. But I've always been aware that I have, at my heart, a kind of resilience that allows me, has allowed me to withstand quite big shocks and traumas in life. And I know I owe that to my music training, as I do what little discipline I have as a novelist. Um, as for the, the other godparent of the book, L.P. Hartley, uh, I don't want to give away too much plot, but in this novel, as in The Go-Between, the hero, young hero, finds himself um, used in an adulterous affair between one of his parents and someone else. Um, the big difference, though, between this novel and The Go-Between is that Eustace is completely unaware that he's being used. In fact, he's unaware of the affair. It's the reader who is looking over his shoulder and is thinking, oh my god, any minute now this poor boy is going to realise what has happened. And I was very keen to preserve Eustace's innocence. We, we see him regularly through the book in his 50s. Uh, so we know he hasn't become a musician. And we know as well that he has a rather, let's say, ambiguous relationship with his elderly mother. But we're never quite sure if even as an adult, he knows what has gone on back in his boyhood, what the full extent of it was. Because of course, as a boy, he is preoccupied as teenagers are with their own sexuality. Oh, sex. <laughs> exactly. sex and music, that's just about, <laughs> just about sums it up, yeah. yeah. It's a really I mean, lovely when we first meet him, When we first meet him, he's much younger than that. He's about seven or eight. Um, but we stay with him through the, the great train wreck of early adolescence. And we watch him get really quite good at the cello, his given instrument. Um, at one point, uh, 
his teacher Carla has a housemate named, named Louis, and he recognizes in the by now adolescent Eustace a secret self. Um, he mentions that Eustace realizes that Louis can see who he really is. And the word yearning comes up several times in Eustace's narrative as well, not just in relation to his musical career, but also coming of age. As a, a teenager, he's lent a copy of A Room with a View and one of the many name checks you give Forster throughout your work. And he's told he's the perfect age for it because it's about yearning and escape. I was really impressed though in the book, uh, the way you make Eustace admirably unconfused about who he is. He's just uncertain of how much he can risk revealing to others. Is that is that right? Absolutely, yes. Um, so he, he gradually realizes that he's gay. Um, part, partly or largely, it has to be said, through watching Carla's flatmate, Louis, and his boyfriend um, for the 1970s. It was then quite rare for two men to live together openly. And Eustace, as, as a boy observing them, realizes that they have a kind of marriage. And he begins to learn about himself, partly through talking to them, partly through reading their books. It's a very um, literary adolescence he has. And I, I was really keen to show it, not exactly my adolescence, it's a very different adolescence to mine, but like my adolescence, there's no trauma about the fact that he's gay. The trauma is purely the very kind of British embarrassment of how he will go about revealing this and how he's, it's going to, he's going to manage it. But I, I didn't want it to be about the difficulty of being gay. It's, it's, it's about other difficulties. The gayness really isn't a problem. No, he certainly has other difficulties. And as you say, we do not want to give away the sort of major betrayal in the book that has very dire consequences for his family. I did want to ask you a question about secrets, but I think it would be best if we hear your reading first and then we can talk about that. Would you read to us from the novel, please? Of course. Of course, I'm going to read a bit from very near the beginning of the book. Eustace, like, um, like a lot of people in Western Supermare, lives in an old people's home. It's actually his father's boyhood home, which his father has turned into an old people's home so as to get um, effectively subsidized care for his own uh, parents. And his, so Eustace is growing up with two grandparents in the house. And in this scene, he's talking to his rather terrifying grandmother, playing cards with her. It was Granny who told him when she grew bored of playing bezique with him. You have two older sisters, she said. He hadn't even asked her a question. They hadn't been talking about families. She just fixed him with her gloomy gaze, her blue eyes made even bigger by her thick glasses. You had two sisters, twins, four years older than you, but they died. One died being born, strangled by the other's cord, and the survivor lived an hour, then sort of gave up. The other was bigger and stronger, but the little one's cord got her. So you were very welcome, but you'll be the last and you can never talk about it. Your mother nearly lost her mind over it. Now, fetch me a barley sugar from my dressing table and take one for yourself. The taste of barley sugars, not a sweet he or any boy he knew would ever actively choose for themselves, was always associated for him with a peculiarly burdensome sensation of secrets, of knowing a thing, yet being unable to share it. To have shared it with any confidence, he'd have needed to understand what he was sharing, and there were elements of the revelation that baffled him. He had watched pregnant women out of the corner of his eye when out shopping, knew the way their extra bulk changed their gait, and failed to imagine either his mother or granny in such a condition. And he knew husbands were involved in the process, but Granny's gladiatorial talk of cords and strength alarmed him. It offered an explanation, at least, for why his parents were so unlike the ones on television or in children's stories. Their connection to one another seemed arbitrary. Their characters lacked common ground. It seemed to Eustace that his father could quite happily have remained a bachelor. He was a happy man, flippant, his mother called it entirely lacking in the energy to go out and make money, build tree houses, play football with other fathers on Saturdays, or assist in the making of further babies. 
he had never settled in any job, drifting, his mother's word again, from national service to helping run a factory that made wooden toys to working at Wilton Carpets before marriage and fate handed him the endless job of running his mother's house as a home. Now he did things like change light bulbs or restock bathrooms with lavatory paper and did them with a cheerful slowness that could have been designed to make Eustace's mother cross, but was probably no more than what it seemed, light-hearted, oblivious self-absorption. Eustace had always taken his jokey manner at face value. His father was a happy son to his mother's clouded moon. After Granny's shocking revelation, however, Eustace reassessed him. As the father of two dead daughters and a man with three dead brothers, he should have been crying all the time. His father's cheeriness now seemed brittle and unconvincing, a clay mask which the wrong response might cause to crack, revealing something frightening, something not quite a face. Yoda Patrick, thank you very much for that reading. And thinking about masks, about memories, about secrets, let's talk some more. Eustace observes at one point that the world's divided to him between those who can't stop remembering and people like his mother, who he says, her graceful progress through life is oiled by a selective memory. Now the characters in your novel keep many secrets like the one we've just heard in your reading. His mother, in fact, has a major secret that cannot ever be broached. And as you say, perhaps he doesn't even realize. But when you write about his granny, who was a brilliant character, Eustace describes her later in the book as living her life with the utmost discretion and lack of fuss. And I wondered, what is the difference between secrets and discretion? Oh, that's a very good question. I think, I think it's a generational thing. I, I was very close to my grandmother. She you was know, the only grandparent I knew growing up. And it always struck me that she was a very, very good keeper of secrets, but also a very good winkler out of other people's stories. So she told me loads of stories about her other relatives. And it was only after her death I found out all sorts of things about her. Whereas my mother of a later generation was a real emotional splurger and would horrify me by telling complete strangers on trains, things that I thought were really private and she would just come out with it. Um, I think, I think in a way, this secrets and discretion balance goes to the heart of, in some ways, the, the national character of, of the British. Uh, well, the English, at least. I think the Scots and the Welsh are, have very different ways of approaching their secrets. Um, Stephen Fry is quoted as, as saying you pull off the Forsterian trick of hovering between social comedy and apocalyptic tragedy. And there is an enormous trick to this, I think, of writing a book in which terrible things occur, but it's not a book that's melodramatic or sentimental. It shows adults who can be warm and loving as well as ones who are hopeless and damaging. It shows how teenagers can be both cruel and vulnerable at the same time. How do you walk this line as a writer? How do you manage the balance between light and dark? It's funny, I think the comic is my natural voice, my natural tone but my interests go in quite the other end of the spectrum. So I've always got the two in play. And although my plots often go into very dark places, I think I use comedy as a way of drawing the reader into my trust or getting me into their trust maybe, and then leading them into the dark place. But also I think it's important to remember that Comedy in, in our daily lives is, is a reflex action often against pain and embarrassment. And of course, pain and embarrassment are the two great items in every novelist's store cupboard. Um, so it, it's always worth, I think, being aware of how you personally are using that comedy when you're writing, as well as of how your characters use it. So my comedy, I always think of as funny ouch rather than funny ha-ha. It's often directly linked to something painful or embarrassing. And as soon as you say those words, painful and embarrassing, I immediately think of my own teenage years, of course. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> I think many of us do. Uh, just briefly, but before we have to move on, I'm, I'm fascinated by, I mean, the way your work always plays around with notions of entrapment and, and escape. 
And I think about your childhood, which is quite unusual, growing up around prisons. Your father was a prison governor, then oh. under Secretary of State for prisons. And then I read that you've expressed a desire to adapt a novel for television set in a nunnery. And I'm thinking, is your childhood responsible for this love of enclosure? <laughs> I think it probably is because I, I grew up in prison. I mean, in those days, the governor and his family lived inside the prison compound. And then I was sent away to boarding school at seven. Um, I went to a series. I had the most amazing education, but Winchester and New College Oxford are not exactly preparations for real life. They're, they're very enclosed and effectively monastic. So I think that marked me for life. I've always been fascinated by institutions and how people behave in them. And uh, I've always had a weakness for novels about nuns. <laughs> Make of that what you will. But uh, Sylvia Townsend Warner, the, the corner that held them is the novel I would love to adapt for screen one day. I think it's incredibly funny and uh, just the most wonderful evocation of life in a, a nunnery during the years of the Black Death. So it's a more realistic evocation than say Sound of Music, would you say? Oh, I'm not sure how realistic it is, but it's very, very funny. You know, I think it's a thinly masked satire of women she knew in the early 20th century. But what she's clearly interested in is women and power and what happens when you exclude the men and give all the power to the women and then let in a few men secretly and let some of the women get pregnant and so on. I, I won't spoil the, 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 the plot for people who haven't read it, but I, I can hugely recommend it. I, I'm thrilled to see that um, Townsend Warner's novels are all being reissued and a lovely new edition from Vintage. So we can all go out and relish them again. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Patrick. Please uh, stay close Thanks. by and we'll come back and talk to you again at the end of the session. Kia ora. Thanks. Our next guest is Julia Ebner, who was born in Vienna and now lives in London when she's not in Ibiza. Uh, she, where she's a research fellow at the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, leading projects on online extremism, disinformation and hate speech. She's acted as a consultant for NATO, the UN and the World Bank, and she briefed intelligence analysts who gathered at the New Zealand High Commission in London after the Christchurch mosque attacks of 2019. In Going Dark, The Secret Social Lives of Extremists, already a Deshpigal bestseller, Julia investigates, infiltrates, and interacts with neo-Nazis, pro-ISIS hackers, the anti-feminist trad wives, jihadi brides, and the alt-right groups who plotted the lethal 2017 Charlottesville rally, among others. Obviously, uh, part of my discussion today with Julia will involve the Christchurch attacks, and the, these are still very raw for many of us here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So please, uh, viewers, use your discretion in listening and sharing this episode with others. Tēnā koe, Julia, and Grüß Gott. Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, now, sorry, go ahead, Julia. Yeah, no, it's great. I'm, I'm really happy that, uh, that this can take place even in this online format. So I just wanted to express um, my biggest thank you to, to the organizers. Thank you very much. We've been really enjoying it, I have to say, despite everything. Now, this book, you say, is about deception and manipulation to expose extremist strategies in cyberspace. And you had to adopt numerous guises and fake identities, just as that neo-Nazi group planning Charlottesville, as you discuss in the book, agreed to wear the MAGA hats to make themselves look like what they call normal Trump supporters rather than the neo-Nazis they are. Now, some of the people within the groups you infiltrated were afraid of being the one weak link in the chain. How did you manage your own fear? To be honest, there were moments where I was definitely doubting whether I was doing the right thing and where I was um, conscious of the dangers that come necessarily with going undercover with different extremist movements. And in the beginning, uh, to be honest, I was more afraid of the ISIS hackers and of the ISIS uh, or jihadist um, brides, for example, and of more of that jihadist um, side of the spectrum. But I had really underestimated how well organized and how um, nasty some of the campaigns coming from the far right can be. And of course, also some of the attacks that, um, that were linked to the networks that I was doing research in. So 
I have to say throughout the research, I really um, sometimes got goosebumps when I was sitting in, in meetings with um, white nationalist movements or going to uh, a neo-Nazi festival at the border of Germany and Poland. And the, the thing that scared me most though was the online dimension because uh, it's really, there, there are new trends that are emerging that far right groups are using, especially to intimidate political opponents uh, researchers, but also journalists and and even artists, who who voice um, yeah who 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 just voice a different opinion online, and they uh, get really they're really getting quite good at, for example, digging out all the personal details online and doxing people. So basically, leaking personal addresses, leaking personal phone numbers. So I was being very careful uh, with my own cybersecurity to really prevent that from happening. It's interesting that you bring up this thing called doxing because it's one thing that's currently being used to justify the absence of identification on the federal agents in Portland, Oregon. You know, they were ordered into that city by Chad Wolf, the interim head of the US Department of Homeland Security to the anger of the state's governor and the city's mayor. It seems very surreal and dystopian. So doxing is occurring from the state as well as from the subversives, the subversives. Now, is this an instance of, of what you talk about in the book as the creation of instability? Yeah, I would say this is this is definitely one of the key tactics that um, extremists have been using to to just to intimidate, um, yeah, to intimidate their opponents, but also to create a sense of um, everything is is possible and how how unstable also democracies can become. Um, and of course, jihadist attacks were doing the same thing, or in a, in a sense that jihadist networks like ISIS were also trying to create chaos and to create that sense of instability, uh, because their ultimate goal was to, to spark a civil war, basically. And the far right has been doing exactly the same thing. So we can also look at uh, events like the Christchurch attacks or the attacks that followed after that. Um, as instances of or attempts to to really spark that conflict or to escalate existing tensions and i think that's also the biggest danger of terrorism that and also of, of online campaigns or any form of of provocation in in a way that gets media attention that this can lead to to deeper uh, societal changes and also political changes and it can definitely silence um, journalists or academics as we've seen in the past Absolutely. Um, talk, talking about Christchurch in your book and, and elsewhere in the book, you talk about the great replacement theory, which you say is being normalized by far right populists in government around the world. And you note that on the day after the Christchurch attacks, Trump equated migrants with invaders. But what is this the great replacement theory? The great replacement theory is basically now has become kind of the most prominent conspiracy theory among far right extremists, especially white nationalists, who believe that uh, that the white European populations and the quotation marks are facing an eradication or are uh, are being replaced by non white immigrants by non white populations, and that demographic change poses a significant threat to um, to, they would of course separate in us and them, so to our societies. And this is, uh, this has been really, as we saw in the last year, has been really dangerous because it's been inspiring different, a whole range of terrorist attacks, starting with the Christchurch shooter, but also then attacks in, in the US, in Poway and El Paso, that followed a very similar pattern and both, um, at both, both uh, attackers also adhere to that ideology or to that conspiracy theory. And then also in Halle in Germany, we had a very similar scenario where, again, the great replacement theory was, uh, yeah, I would say, key in driving the perpetrator. I'd like to talk more uh, to you about the Christchurch attacks, but should we have a reading from your book first? Would you read to us, Julia? Yeah, uh, happy to do that. So just as a as a quick um, introduction to the, the section that I will be reading, this is actually relevant to just uh, your last question about the great replacement theory, because the group Generation Identity is a white nationalist pan-European movement that has been inspiring the Christchurch shooter, but also um, other attackers. And it's one of the, I would say the movement probably world, on a worldwide scale that has the 
um, the widest reach in terms of spreading this idea that white populations are being gradually replaced. And uh, yeah, and the Christchurch shooter was even in contact with actually the Austrian leader of the movement uh, with Martin Sellner. So I will read uh, from a meeting that I went to because I was recruited by the movement. I created online identities uh, to, to, yeah, to be accepted by the different extremist movements. In this case, I joined Generation Identity at their uh, secret strategy meeting in London. Generation Identity is very 2010s. When they hold a secret strategy meeting, they rent an Airbnb in South London. To be precise, in Brixton, one of London's most multicultural areas, known for its riots against police racism in the 1980s. I am the last person to arrive at the Airbnb on Sunday morning. The Austrian leader of Generation Identity, Martin Sellner, stands outside next to his new girlfriend, the prominent American alt-right YouTuber, Brittany Pettibone. To my relief, Martin has lost his glasses. He might have recognized me otherwise, even with my blonde wig, as we had featured together in, an BBC, in a BBC Newsnight report in late 2016. Good to finally meet you, Jennifer, he says in German. A firm handshake, a charming smile, and we head to the living room. I'm afraid you missed the introductions. Could you please say a few words about yourself? I look around and recognize a few familiar faces from last night. So I went to another, to a pub meeting the previous night. Tor and Liam are there again with Ray-Bans and t-shirts. There is a slightly surreal feeling about sitting in a holiday home surrounded by a dozen well-dressed white nationalists sipping R. White's lemonade. After I have finished telling Jennifer's story again, by now I'm starting to feel more comfortable adding details and anecdotes, all newcomers, including myself, are asked, are asked to complete a questionnaire. This is part of the identitarian brand risk management, as Martin explains. It involves questions ranging from favorite books and movies to more explicit inquiries about political leanings and ideologies. I try hard to make up something credible while not opting for the usual suspects. George Orwell's 1984 would have been a little too cliche as it's known to be the far right's regular metaphor for today's state of censorship and surveillance. Far right uh, Fight Club and The Matrix are also standard alt-right movies. Indeed, Hannibal Bateman, the managing editor of the white supremacist magazine Radix Journal, explained in an article entitled Generation Alt-Right that for many alienated young white men, our credo could be summed up in that most angsty of films fight club, citing the following dialogue from the movie. So now there's a quotation from the movie. We're the middle children of history, man. No purpose or place. We have no great war, no great depression. Our great war is a spiritual war. Is a spiritual war. Our great depression is our lives. We've all been raised on television to believe that one day we'd all be millionaires and movie gods and rock stars, but we won't. And we're slowly le learning that fact. And we're very, very pissed off. So this kind of shows the, um, the atmosphere that has been created at Generations Identities um, meeting. They then go on to, to give a full uh, briefing on what the ideologies encompass, but also uh, Martin Selner then gave us a, a briefing on how to deal with journalists, for example, to avoid uh, yeah, to avoid being portrayed as, as neo-Nazis and how to get how to deal with tricky questions such as are you anti-Semitist or are you racist? And that was also quite quite a chilling experience to see how um, how skillful they were in, in their brand management and how much they incorporated also these subcultural elements like even movies and uh, pop culture and and music and and books into their into creating that uh, counterculture and into really creating those social bonds. Julia, will you tell us the book and the movie you chose to uh, say were your favorites? I, I believe I actually chose Star Wars um, because it was is that correct now? Yes. I actually have to look it up. Yes, yeah, it's correct. Um, yeah, I chose Star Wars because it, it seemed like there is a clear good and bad side, at least in the, in the early ones. Um, and I felt, yeah, I felt it, it's, it's 
a normal movie to choose. I didn't want to be too explicit yet because I was also pretending to be a bit naive, a newcomer. There was no need to show that I'm already into all the, the alt rights favorite movies. So I just chose that movie because I felt it was at least there was not it was not a no go movie such as there there could also there are also more recent movies that they would see as oh wow um, there's too many black people acting in it or this is um, a, kind of again they would paint the whole of Hollywood sometimes as as an as a, a Jewish conspiracy. Uh, so it's there are definitely movies that would have been no goes, but I think Star Wars was quite on the safe side, so to say. But you also chose uh, Kafka's *The Trial* as a novel. Now Kafka is a Jewish writer, but is *The Trial* embraced by the alt right as acceptable? In a sense, yeah, and it's quite interesting their relationship um, for for generation identity, at least, especially the German. Um, the German generation identity leaders, they really try to distance themselves from uh, Nazi Germany and from anti-Semitism because they know they would never be successful in, in Germany if they were even, if they were explicitly uh, portraying any anti-Semitic views. So that was not a problem. And I think Kafka, um, Kafka's the trial, Kafka's the trial, they can identify themselves with it because they also uh, believe that they're facing a massive blockade from the establishment or a massive um, yeah massive hurdles bureaucratic hurdles but also just in general the state system that's something they're really opposed to and i think kafka's trial was was kind of a good option because it's similar to in some ways it's even um i think similar to to always 1984 um, in that sense in dealing with um with structural problems or with um that opposition to the um, to bureaucracy, to the state, to the establishment, or that's something how that's how they interpret it. Now, in your chapter, Gamified Terrorism, you explore the subcultures behind the Christchurch mosque attacks, which happened as you were finishing your book. And you identified a new element there, the appropriation of gaming elements for terror. What do you mean by this? I would say we are now facing a completely new form of, of terrorism, indeed um, a gamified form of terrorism. And gamification means basically adding game gaming elements or or game yeah game like elements to situations that have nothing to do with games. Originally, it comes from more from products that have been gamified or from employee um, incentive structures where you have gamification to, to motivate people. Uh, the same has happened in the political space. Now some, uh, even some campaigns are run based on games and to, to galvanize people into voting. And terrorism have, uh, terrorists have also appropriated that technique of gamification for first for their recruitment. So ICE is already gamified, for example, their propaganda and their campaigns. For example, they painted uh, jihadists on, or they, they used jihadist heads on top of video game uh, covers to almost give off the impression that uh, they're heading to, to a video game like scenario in Syria or in Iraq where they can be the martyrs. And they, yeah, they copy pasted that onto the video game Call of Duty. Uh, and called it call for jihad. And the same is true for, for some of the campaigns that I've seen in the neo-Nazi channels where they've gamified their trolling campaigns, where they have created almost military-like structures where you could be promoted from a soldier to a general to, to a supreme commander if you did really well on carrying out hate campaigns, for example. So terrifying, but um, and then the latest, or the, yeah, the latest development was with Christchurch that uh, the perpetrator, for the first time, used gamification for the act of terrorism itself. That he uh, filmed it from with the live stream from a first-person shooter's angle or ego ego shooter angle, and he also added um, even gaming language in in his both his manifesto and also his live stream. And really, the entire online uh, far right gaming uh, scene or gaming subculture was then quite excited about this, and it was terrible to watch because they were, for example, turning his live stream into versions of a computer game where they gave scores um, and counted the ammunition he still has for every shot uh, Muslim. So that was really, yeah, quite shocking because also a lot of young members were joining in here. 
and then the next the next few attackers um it was really a wave that this created a wave of inspirational terrorism or of copycat terrorism because the next shooters in Poway, El Paso and Halle did the same thing and also added game-like elements to their to their own live streams or manifestos. For example, in Halle, the, the attacker uh, created his own weapons with a 3D printer. That's a reference to something in gaming that's called weapons crafting. And um, yeah, and he even had a list of achievements, what he would like to kind of get, what kind of scores he would like to, to get. And it's, I would say it's a very scary dynamic because of course games um, are repeatable, but also um, people are competing for higher scores. And that was also the impression you got when looking into those channels where they were calling for, oh, the next one, the next shooter has to get a higher score than Anders Breivik years ago in, in Norway, who killed 77 people. This is all very hard to listen to, Julia. Uh, and I can't imagine how you are able to um, be in so many conversations and so many difficult conversations and situations. You do say in the book that we've entered a new era of extremism where what was once fringe is now mainstream, but you do end the book with some predictions for the future and also some solutions that we can work towards immediately. Would you like to just talk about them very briefly, the notion of what we can do now to, um, to deal with a, this new era? Yeah, I think there's there's a whole range of, of things we can do. And I'd also like to add a few um, ideas for, especially now during the coronavirus lockdown, I think that, that some of the disinformation and conspiracy theories have unfortunately spread or found an even bigger audience because people have been um, almost tied to their computers and have been spending more time online. And also, of course, because of the information vacuum and the grievances and, and insecurities that this has created. But I am quite optimistic in the long run that we can that we can tackle the problem. And I think a big part, and I also mentioned that in this last part, in this last part of the book, is uh, of course about education and really about um, tackling issues related to online spaces, online subcultures, in in a way that's appropriate to to what's what's happening today. Because I think we have addressed in many school curricula. Uh, at least in the UK and also in other countries, and I imagine it's the same in New Zealand, we have addressed uh, the topic of um, digital, di digital citizenship or digital skills in general, um, and also digital literacy, for example, being able to tell a part piece of disinformation from a credible source or um, a reliable piece of information. But there hasn't been enough education on the topic of almost this, the psychology of, of what these online spaces do to us as, as human beings and what they do to, to groups, but also to, to the individual psychology, how you can get addicted in or, and, and, and create incredibly strong group bonds when you get into such subcultures and, and also how these online group dynamics can sometimes escalate into something where um, it's sometimes you, the, the lines between what's real and what's what's uh, a game or what's trolling and what's terrorism become really blurry. And those are dangers that haven't really been warned of. And I think this is both something for the younger generations to be um, addressed in, in schools, in high schools, but also, of course, something that concerns older generations and digital, not just digital natives, but digital migrants. Um, then... I also think just a second idea, I mean, I'm, I have, I think I have 10 different or diff yeah, lots of different suggestions in the last chapter, but another idea is uh, a better uh, system for online interventions, online de-radicalization programs, where intervention providers really go into such darker spaces of the internet and reach out to people who are in the process of radicalizing. And um, I think New Zealand really has, has reacted very, very well, incredibly well. I was very impressed. Um, after Christchurch, also um, with, with all of the calls um, it has made on and used the world stage it had at that moment, um, after this happened to really uh, yeah, provoke change in the space of tech companies um, taking down harmful content and really regulating more to, to avoid that such radicalizations can happen. 
Um, but I think also on the civil society level, there can be more interventions, there can be government supported programs where psychologists and, uh, and also uh, former extremists go into these spaces and create a dialogue, a bit what we're doing right now with offline de-radicalization, de but just in, in these darker online um, spaces. Thank you so much, Julia. Please, please stick around uh, a little bit longer while I talk to Michelle and, and join our conversation again. Danke schön. Thank you. Uh, talking to Julia and thinking about the power of words leads us, of course, to Michelle Leggett, my esteemed colleague at the University of Auckland, where she is a professor of English, coordinates the New Zealand Electronic Poetry Centre, and is, of course, uh, a, a very uh, acclaimed and well-respected poet here in New Zealand, New Zealand's inaugural poet laureate, the recipient of a Prime, Minister, Prime Minister's Literary Award, and a fellow of the Royal Society of New Zealand. Um, I have a quote here from David Eggleton, who is our current poet laureate. He describes Michelle as our finest living female rhapsodist and writes that she shows us that the ordinary is full of marvels which flow together into sequences and episodes that in turn form an ongoing serial or bricolage, a single poem then rejecting exactness, literalism, naturalism in favor of resonance, currents, patterns of ebb and flow at a time when we need art and literature and speaking out and discussion more than ever. Um, Michelle has published a new collection, Metzaluna, which gathers work from her nine books of poetry and other publications. Tenakwe Michelle and welcome. Kia Paula. Now, Michelle, you are enormously active and busy as both a scholar and a poet. Metzaluna spans your publishing career as a poet dating back to the 80s. Why did you choose now, this moment, to publish a selected poems? Um, I was, it was chosen for me. Um, I had an invitation from Steph Burt um, two, two, three years ago now. Um, he liked my poetry. He was here in New Zealand. And he said to me, you should have a selected poems. And I said, well, yes, okay. He said, have you thought about it? And I said, well, no, I haven't. He said, well, you should, and I'll help you. He's a very, he's a very active person, Steph. Um, and he was the person who first approached Wesleyan University Press uh, in the States. And he interested them and they extended an invitation. So the book that everybody can now buy in fact, is it has two editions. The one that you're probably all looking at is from Auckland University Press, and it's a co-publication from Wesleyan University Press. So Wesleyan, we just got the publication out in February this year, and then Auckland just got the New Zealand edition out in March of this year before lockdown. So you know, like many other books, Metzaluna is, I, I'm so grateful it was published, um, but it feels like a sleeper. Uh, you know, I, I feel like it's, it, and, and I are still waiting to wake up to really look at, at what was happening here and, and, you know, what a selected poem could be. So um, it's a way of saying I'm very grateful to be here this morning answering questions. Michelle, do you... I mean, how do you observe that your work has changed in style or focus over the years? I mean, do you see particular connecting threads emerge as you put together a selected collection like this? Uh, yes, and I think probably it's a common experience when you start out, you know, you start by reading everything and there's a terrible moment of objection. <laughs> oh dear, I've written the same thing over and over and <laughs> over. <laughs> <laughs> and that hit me like a truck. And then you, you, you step back from that and say, no, 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 it's not possible. Um, and then, you know, I, I love editing. I like having a big collection of stuff, any kind of stuff, but, you know, poems in particular, uh, having that big collection, and it's, you know, it spans 30 odd years, and then figuring out what to do with the common threads. Yeah, they need to be there but also trying to put myself in the shoes of people who are coming to my work, the ones that are coming for the first time, the ones that might be interested in picking up such a book and want to see 
you know, what, what, what does a poem by me look like from the 1980s? What does it look like in the 90s? What does it look like in the 2000s and now the 2010s? And that, it, it took a couple of years. The first, the first version I sent off to Wesleyan, they were very polite about it. <laughs> Uh, but basically they said, look, this is far too long. And it was, I hadn't really thought hard. So we went back into the process. I uh, got some readers reports and it's about 200 pages now, I think. And I, for me, I think that's a very nice length for a selected work. I don't think it should be any bigger than that. And I think it gives a reader, a, you know, it gives a generous kind of slice. And I was, I was very careful when I was doing those edits. I was trying to represent each of those books, trying to find, if you like, a kind of DNA version for each of the books. You know, what's, what's important in the early books? What's important in the later books? And it's a very good way of being able to throw out a lot of things. You know, I, I love my books, each one of them. Um, but when you're involved in this kind of super editing project, I think being able to chuck things out is very important. So, you know, people will say, why didn't you include this? And the answer is, well, because I didn't. There were other agendas. <laughs> <laughs> I love the way, Michelle, your, your work is so rich in allusion to other poets. And so you're almost in conversation with them in many of your poems. And your poem, Spirits Bay, specifically recalls the life of Robin Hyde and her visit to the same place in the 30s when she was revising her manuscript of the Godwits Fly, you write of her trying to see the flying off place and getting caught by the tide on the drive back. Now, as a scholar, you're the editor of Young Knowledge, the poems of Robin Hyde, the first chronological record of her poetry. How important is she to you as an influence or a foremother? Totally. You, you just nailed it right then. Um, you know, finding Robin Hyde's work uh, after I came back from Canada in the mid 1980s, I hadn't read her. And I, and, you know, finding that work and then finding the poems, which at that point had been published in a selected version and you know, had not been collected, I couldn't believe this strong female voice that I was hearing from the 1930s. I, I guess I'd read the novels, but I hadn't engaged with the poetry. Mm -hmm. And she, she was an education. That, that, that was the thing that I think coming home uh, from Canada, finding such a strong voice, realizing that there was a pile of work that could be done to bring her back into the light, if you like, or into hearing distance. Uh, because if you don't keep somebody there, you know, in the spotlight or within hearing distance, things tend to drift away. You know, that, oh, a poet of the 30s. But actually, you know, a poet of the 30s has an awful lot to say to us in the current time. And let's talk about another poet bringing back from the darkness into the light. One of the sequences here, Emily and her sisters, reflects the um, very important work you've done into the poet Emily Harris, who died in 1925. Much of her poetry, you say, has disappeared. But what have you been able to uncover of her work? Well, I was very optimistic when I read, uh, when I wrote that note that you've just referred to. Um, Emily Harris, I'm, that was four years ago, okay, and Emily Harris, we know that there was a body of poetry uh, because she talks about it, because she refers to it, because she sometimes quotes from it in the 1880s and 1890s. And at that point, I thought, okay, uh, people in New Zealand particularly know Emily Cumming Harris uh, as an artist. She's a very fine watercolorist of na native New Zealand flora. Uh, and nobody had really figured out that she was, she's a very good writer. We knew about her diaries, but they're the diaries of an artist. And I thought, okay, uh, here's something really interesting because I discovered some writing of hers from 1860 when she was living in Taranaki behind the lines during the first Taranaki war. And there were two poems in that writing, just two. And I thought, okay, uh, this is 2016. We've got two poems by a woman, a young woman, she was 23 at the time, a young woman in Taranaki, which is where I come from. Uh, nobody knew about her writing poetry 
these poems have been sitting in an archive for a long time. Uh, I found eight more poems from the 1880s and 90s, and they concern native flora, they're about flowers. And I read the diaries and realized that here was a completely disappeared poet. And if we could find that body of work, we would have another woman poet to add from the 1860s right through to the probably 1910s. She's probably writing as late as that. And I set myself in 2016, I set out to try and find out what had happened to that body of poetry. It's now 2020, and I have to say, we still have just the 10 poems. So I now say that Emily Harris, you know, we, we, we have the writing, we have the paintings. She is a poet, but like Sappho, the actual work, we've actually got a bit more than Sappho. With Sappho, we only have recorded fragments. But as with Sappho, we have these tiny little bits that come through to us. So my project has kind of changed over the four years. We are still researching, we are still looking. We might get very lucky. We might find the poems or copies of the poems in somebody's shoe box and somebody's wardrobe. You never, with archiving, you can never quite tell. But even if we don't, that doesn't matter. We know that the poetry existed. And my project now is to let as many people know about this extraordinary woman and what she was doing, writing and painting, and to get people so interested that we make a creative response to Emily back there. I, I think of Emily Harris as somebody who all her life, she sat and she painted and she wrote and she wrote poems. She didn't know about us, okay? She didn't realize what would happen to her archive, that in fact, it would get lost, that we wouldn't be able to read those poems. We thank heavens can see the paintings and we do have her wonderful diaries. But if I can interest a number of contemporary writers in throwing a line back to Emily, I think that, you know, in the absence of her work, being able to connect back with that effort, with that writing. She's an extraordinary woman. She's a single woman trying to make a living, trying to be a professional artist. And also we know she's a poet. So that's where that project's going, Paula. It's still- it's fantastic. I, I said at the beginning, it would take five years. Robin Hyde took 10 years. And I think Emily's probably going to take 10. But that's fine, good projects take a long time. And if at the end of it, we have a knowledge of what Emily Harris did, what she was concerned with, she's terribly concerned about the disappearance of the very fragile native flora because the whole country was being cleared for pasture land. And she could tell, she grew up in the bush, she knew, she says, I mean, we knew every flower every plant growing up. And she could tell that all of that burning was very, very bad uh, for the ecosystem. She wouldn't have called it that. She could see what was being destroyed. So I think you know, as, a, as a project of pulling back from the edge of destruction, uh, I think you know, there, are, there are still many ways for the Emily Harrett, Harris Poetry Project to go. I've outlined one of them. Uh, it's just really important to put it back on the map. Michelle, will you read to us from one of your poems now, please? I will. First, I'll just mm -mm, swig. Um, I'm going to read from a poem called The Fascicles, which uh, was, was written before I knew about Emily Harris in Taranaki. I was very interested in finding out about the first Taranaki war. And I set up a poem, quite a long poem called The Fascicles, in which I imagined a young woman who was writing, who was writing about the Taranaki war. And I, I, I made it a kind of dual drive. There was this figure in Christchurch and she was, she was an ancestress of my own. 
And there was me who also went to Christchurch when I was young, and that's where my own writing started. So the fascicles, and I'm, I'm going to read only the first part of it. It concerns two women, it concerns two places, and it concerns two times. And it's about the kind of folding over of memory and history. So, you know, I'm in there somewhere, but I'm in there with a whole lot of other things that you know, have, have interested me. So here we go. The fascicles, one. In darkness, red coats marching out to the Pekka Pekka block. It cannot be true. But imagine for a moment it is. Two women stand almost in the same place, which is the rim of an old volcano. One is remembering her father stepping out of the blockhouse when she was a little girl going down an Irish road, wherever they were just then. The other is stunned by a memory of fruit falling in a dark garden, soft sounds in long lines, or sweet juice over stops and starts, an orchard, a volcano. Neither can be sure because the ground is shifting. They pick themselves up and go on, unaware of the jolt that has put them on the same page and will now tie them to this place, whatever it is. One watches the shadow of a long skirt ripple ahead of her in the afternoon wind. The other has almost reached home with her choir of clean white paper, walking uphill from the shops around the quay. There is dinner to get the washing to be folded, but no children, so there is time for everything connected or unconnected with the red jackets of the soldiers moving along the Devon Road in darkness or in daylight. I love him, she thinks. I vocate, says the other, haptic with risk. Each sits with her head in a pool of lamplight, mind and fingers flying over the mending of works and days, now and then, yes and no. They have torn up the pegs. They dispute the sail. They build a fighting pa on the ridge to the southwest, to Kohia, and draw fire from the valley running down to the bony sea. This is the beginning, the transfer of words for deeds with tails as long as kite strings in a clear blue sky. She folds the creamy sheets of paper and pulls red silk after the needle that pierces and pierces the folds binding, stitching, tying together the new pages of a little book. A booklet, really, pliable, plausible, something to fold down and begin writing. The valley in the dark, the bridge abandoned, the lamplight, the flashing needle, the words I will write from the orchard that is a volcano. For you have shown me the valley in the north and its river running down to the sea where redcoats, militia and volunteer rifles are landing to begin the work of destruction. One moment I am in a dark orchard, the next I hear the ground shake under my feet. I am a soldier's daughter fled away from my father over the sea and finding him again here in the new land. What shall I write? Where should I bury my flashing needle with its red silk tail as long as kite strings in a clear sky? 
I found it in a dictionary. And look, it comes true. These days, with peaches, with intricacies of step and step. Afternoon tea with dancing. Kia ora, Michelle, thank you so much for that. I love to hear you, you read. I wondered if we could bring uh, Patrick and Julia back to take the epigraph for your book, Michelle, as a starting point. Um, the dedication is for those who travel light and lift darkness. And thinking about that, how- That's a poet talking, right? <laughs> yeah. How does art lift the darkness? How do we as writers explore the darkness, go to it, but still offer light to our readers? Um, Michelle, what are your thoughts about this? Well, let's start with those very slippery words. Let's, you know, for, I, I dedicate the book and it's for everybody, for those who travel light and lift darkness. So traveling light, of course, it splits in two. You travel light, meaning you don't take much with you, so you are agile. You can go places like Julia, going to those places. But you're traveling light in the other sense. You're, you're kind of traveling with light. You are that person. You believe in that kind of light as well. So you know, travel light. Let's all travel light. And then lifting darkness, you know, again, <laughs> You know, I, I'm a poet. I, I just can't resist words that can do two things at once. You travel light and you lift darkness. Something is light, meaning you know, it's, it's light, it's very light. And we can lift something that's very heavy and terrible, uh, you know, as you know, those chilling things that Julia is describing. We, and, and I use that plural advisedly, advisedly we can lift darkness as long as we're talking to each other as long as we're traveling light both for three senses of the word so that's what i can offer as a poet the language which is you know it's wonderfully supple it's malleable we can pull the meanings to it that we need to pull okay there will be other meanings that other people will pull to themselves and those are meanings that you know, I'm, I'm not interested in those meanings some of them um, but I do have uh, it, it's a sense as Patrick said a sense of resilience that, that human beings will find their way to these resilience places of resilience and will be able to reach each other and to build or rebuild so that's what I meant about traveling light and lifting darkness. Patrick, the, the poet issues us, the novelist, the challenge. Do you accept it? Oh, totally, totally. I, it's very interesting. I, I, I've been watching all my writing friends through the course of, of the lockdown and pandemic and thinking actually it's been terribly good for them because the huge rise in um, public appearance demands for writers, the, the, the great sort of book festival industry, in a way has made a lot of us, I think, unhealthily unwritely. And we're doing far too, we've been doing far too much traveling and not nearly enough staying at home in the garden and thinking and reading. Um, so I know the pandemic has been terrible for the world economy and has brought tragedy to many a community, but I do hope it's going to leave our global writing community the stronger and better able to help and to lift the darkness as we emerge. And Julia, you continue with what you're doing. You are not deterred by anything you've come across so far. No, um, I, I mean, I, I do continue with some of the online undercover investigations, but I won't go undercover offline anymore, I think. I really like the um, the idea of traveling light and to lift darkness. I think it's um, I, it made me think of of the transitions that, of course, extremists make when they, especially when they travel out of extremist movements again. It shows um, and the transitions I made or how lightly I changed from one identity to the next, not carrying much with me, kind of just the identity, just my building my own past, present and future in those characters, almost like you would build the character in the novel. 
to make it credible. But then at the same time, this, these transitions can also happen, of course, on the extremist side to lift their darker side or to their, their darkness. And, um, and I really, it gave me a lot of hope and optimism to see that humans are, are so capable of changing and of adapting. And I believe um, seeing also those human dimensions and elements that are still present in, in pretty much all the extremists that I talked to, uh, that was really something that, that comforted me and where I think there is a lot of uh, potential for bringing those people out of these darker spaces. And maybe that is by traveling um, lightly and trying to make a step towards them and yeah, to bring them out. Thank you so much to all three of you. I found our conversation incredibly absorbing today. And I'm very sorry that we have to stop now, quite a lot behind the schedule. Um, but thank you so much to Patrick Gale, to Julia Ebner, and to Michelle Leggett. Um, thank you to everyone else who's made this episode possible, especially the Auckland Writers Festival team, Auckland Live and Copyright Licensing New Zealand. Kia ora also to the sponsors and partners listed on the festival's website. Thank you so much for your crucial support that makes conversations like this possible, even though, as Patrick pointed out, we should all really be home writing. Now, uh, join us again next week for our final episode in our winter series to celebrate 13 episodes of extraordinary books and inspiring conversations. We'll be featuring an extra writer in our lineup. So not just three writers, but four. And they are the award-winning American novelist Anne Patchett, discussing her latest book, The Dutch House. New Zealand essayist Rose Liu with her debut collection, All Who Live on Islands iconic British travel writer and novelist Colin Thubron with Shadow of the Silk Road, and Irish-British writer Maggie O'Farrell with her most recent novel Hamnet about Shakespeare's 11-year-old son. It's a great final lineup. See you one last time next week. Matewa.